stickers and doing writings over things like Z and ZP. Uh, so that's what we're going to do for this lecture and next one. Um, today we're just going to do elliptic curves. I want to make sure that we understand everything about reduction of elliptic curves very well. And next time we'll do abelian varieties and neuron models. So uh, a good reference for today is chapter 7 of Silver. Uh, most of what I'm going to say is going to be in there, but I'll see a few things that are. So throughout today, uh, R is going to be a complete DDR. K is going to be its field of fractions. P is going to be its maximum ideal. Uh, K is the, little k is the rest of the field. Maybe M is better. And uh, B is evaluation on K. So uh, we can work with a general complete DVR for most of what I'm going to say. It doesn't have to be QP. I mean, it doesn't have to be like the ring of energies in a finite dimension of QP. I'm going to assume, I'm going to make a simplifying assumption that the characteristic of the residue field is not 2 or 3. That lets us put our bias stress equations in very particular forms that are kind of easy to deal with explicitly. Okay, so suppose we have a elliptic curve over K. And we know that we can write this curve in the form y squared equals x cubed plus a plus b. This is one place where I'm using the assumption that k is not two or three the rest of the curve. So if this form of the equation is not unique, uh, if you make the change of variables, x, y goes to um, u squared x, u cubed y, then that's going to change the equation. The a, b gets changed to u to the minus 4a, u to the minus 6b. So notice that you can always you know, pick a u and scale up a and b so that they're in the ring of energy. And it's natural then to try to kind of pick the optimal model of it in the ring of integers. And so you, you can always, I mean, if, the, if A and B are integers, if the valuation of B is bigger than 6 and the valuation of A is bigger than 4, then you can take U to be a uniformizer and move the valuations down. And you can keep doing this until one of those conditions is not true. So we say that the equation is minimal. The valuation of A is strictly less than 4, or the valuation of B is strictly less than 6. And this is, in fact, equivalent to the valuation, oh, oh sorry, A and B are an R and this fault. And this is equivalent to saying that A and B are an R and the valuation of delta is minimal, meaning minimal over all possible models like this. And once you've got a minimal equation, it's still not unique because you can change by letting u be a unit, but that's all you can do. So this is unique up to change variables with u being a unit. So I'm going to let E, this kind of script E, be the projective curve over spec R defined by the minimal equation. So this is called a, a minimal virus stress model of normal E. And such a thing is unique up to isomorphism because the equations are unique up to changes of units. I'm going to use an isomorphism on the properties. Okay, so I'm going to make a few definitions to introduce the things that we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to let E bar be the special fiber of this script E. So that, all that means is you know, you're reducing this equation mod maximal idea. So this is a projective curve 
over little k. And it's not hard to show that it's irreducible, it's given explicitly by that kind of equation. But it's not necessarily smooth. Uh, I'll write E bar sub SM for smooth locus. And the interesting thing about that is that it's canonically a group. So this is a group like it. And the group law works just like it works on E. I mean, we didn't talk about this, but you probably know that addition and elliptic curve you can do by drawing secant lines and doing some flipping. And you can do that with any cubic equation. That always gives you a group law on the non-singular points. So the, the, the smooth focus here is, again, a group right. So since E is projective, its R points are the same as its K points. Of course, the K points, that's just another name for the K points of normal E. So we can define a map from E of K to E bar of little k. This is the, called the reduction map. So concretely, the way that works is if you have a k point here, you have to use the projective equation. So put these in to make it homogeneous. And then you can scale out the denominators and make you know, x, y, and z all the matrix. And then you can actually literally reduce them by the end, and that would give you a point with the projective point downstairs. Uh, I'm going to let e sub 0 of k be the subset of E of K, consisting of those points whose reduction down here lands inside the smooth locus. So it, this subset is a subgroup. And the reduction map on E0 is a group of one. And furthermore, it's surjective. And that's just tensile form. If we have a smooth point downstairs, we can lift it up. Sometimes it's and then finally, I'm going to define E1, okay, to be the kernel of this one. So we started to break up the K points of E into a few different pieces. Try to understand those separately. Okay, so the first thing that I want to talk about is the types of reduction that are possible. So our E bar. This reduced equation. Let me, for the moment, uh, write it like this. So it's x cubed plus, let's say, a bar x plus b bar, where a bar and b bar are the reductions of a and b. So this equation is uh, smooth if and only if the reduced discriminant is not zero. So this thing, remember, was minus 16. Uh, something like that. I 4a squared plus 27b squared cubed plus 27b squared. I think that's right. Okay. And of course, the reduced discriminant being non zero is the same thing as saying that upstairs the discriminant is a unit of R. 
So in this case, when the discriminant's a unit, this reduced equation is smooth and it's an elliptic curve. And in this case, so if this happens, we say that E has good reduction. And in this, in this case, this minimal Weierstrass model, the whole thing is a scheme over R, is smooth over spec R. And it's actually a group scheme over spec R. Okay, but what if the discriminant is zero? And you're singular. And there's basically two possibilities. I mean, you know, the discriminant is detecting if roots are colliding, and so either two roots can collide or all three roots can collide. So the two cases are um, if both A bar and B bar are zero, that's when all the roots collide. So then the equation is just y squared equals x cubed. Then this E bar has a single singular point. And that's zero, zero. And it's a cost. And so what E bar looks like, I mean, it's a projective curve. It's like P1, but you've taken one point and made a cuspidal singularity. So when you move that point, you have A1. And in fact, the smooth locus is isomorphic to GA as a group. And so because of that, you say that E has additive reduction in this case. And the other possibility is that the discriminant is zero, but A and B are non-zero. And since the discriminant is zero, I mean, because of this expression, if one is non-zero, then the other one has to be non-zero because they add up to zero. The other possibility is that A bar and B bar are both non-zero. And in this case, E bar, again, has a single, only one singular point. And uh, its coordinates are x coordinates minus 3 e bar over 2 a bar times 0. And it's a node. And the picture for this is you should think of like it's P1 with two points, a 0 and infinity identified. So when you remove them, you get P1 minus two points. So it looks like GM, and that's what it is. So the smooth locus is isomorphic to GM as a group. Uh, sorry, it's isomorphic to GM over K bar. So, over K bar as a group. And because of that, you say that you have, you have multiplicative reduction in this case. And if that isomorphism actually holds over K, so if the smooth locus is isomorphic to GM over K, then you say it has split multiplicative reduction. That's the definition. And that condition is very concrete. It just says that uh, this is equivalent to minus B bar over 2A bar being a square in K. So, to summarize, there's good reduction, and that's equivalent to delta being a unit. There's multiplicative reduction, and that's equivalent to delta being a non unit, but both A and B being units. And then there's additive reduction. 
that's equivalent to both A and B being run uh, calling it M, not P, so max that here. And there's a few other terms that I'll probably use, so I won't say what they are. Uh, if you're multiplicative or additive, it's called bad induction. It's not good induction. And good or multiplicative is called semi-stable. And that's equivalent to one of A or B being a I'm normalizing all the valuations so the uniformizers have valuation one. So in general, V prime is going to be the ramification index times V, or maybe the other way around. Um, so if you're unramified, they're the same. And so if you have, you know, if y squared equals x cubed plus a x plus b is minimal over k, well, that means that. You know, that's a condition on the valuations of A and B. That's saying that the valuation of A is less than 4, but the valuation of B is less than 6. And of course, that's still going to hold if I change the Bs to B primes. semi-stable reduction, that was saying that one of A or B is a unit, right? So in case B, valuation of A equals zero, or the valuation of B is zero. And so that, and that implies that the valuation over K prime of one of them is zero. Because you just multiply the valuations by E. And so that says that the equation still stays in that one. So I didn't say anything about what happens if you have additive reduction over k. When you go up to k prime, this theorem doesn't say anything. And in fact, you can always make additive reduction go away. So this is an important result of the semi-stable reduction theorem. So it says there exists a finite extension, k prime over k, such that uh, e has semi-stable reduction over k prime. So I like that as SSD.
And the proof of this is very easy in our situation. So we have our equation y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And remember, we're allowed to change a, b. We can make a change of variables to scale a by u to the minus 4 and b to the minus, scale b by u to the minus 6. And we want to make the equation semi-stable, which means we want to make either a or b a unit. And so all you do is, I mean, you know, you just scale by the fourth root of a, and that makes a 1. And that'll keep things good as long as there's some inequality on the valuations of a and b to keep this an integer. So here's precisely what happens. So if 3 times the valuation of a is less than equal to 3 times the valuation of b, then you take u to be a to the 1 fourth. And then, well, let me write this one as a prime b prime. So that's going to give you a prime equal to 1. And b prime is going to be b over this to the sixth, which is a to the 3 halves. And by this condition, that thing is still going to be integral. So that gives us a new equation for our curve over the field where this thing exists. So over k prime, which I'm defining as k is by a to the 1 fourth, b has some stable reduction. goes the other way, then use, use, use b to the 1 6. So this gives b prime equal 1, and a prime is going to be a divided by b to the 1 6 to the 4th, so b to the 2 thirds. It's going to be an r, this is an inequality. So that means that over k prime, which is b to the 1 6, so these kind of explicit arguments of Weierstrass equations are much harder in character two or three, where the form of the Weierstrass equation is more complicated. That's why I made that simplifying assumption just to make these proofs very easy. So uh, one thing to notice, or remark, is that you can always take. Uh, this k prime have to be almost 6. In the situation where the characteristic is not 2 or 3. Because you're always just adjoining the fourth through this system. Is that false? I think so. I think you have to go up to higher degrees. Okay, so combining the last two things that we proved, we showed that semi-stable reduction always stays the same as you go up, and additive reduction will turn into semi-stable reduction. That says that if you have any curve E, then, so, for a sufficiently large field K prime, the reduction type of E over k prime uh, is constant and either good or multiplicative. By constant here, it's being independent of the choice of k prime. And so in this first case, we say that E has potentially good reduction. Here you say that E has potentially multiplicative reduction. So you'd like to know just from looking at the equation if you have potentially good or potentially multiplicative. Right? And there's a, a simple test for that. So E has potentially good reduction if and only if it's J invariant, which is recall is minus 1728 times 4a cubed over delta. So if and only if that guy is integral.
And so here's the proof. So the J invariant is an invariant of the curve. It doesn't matter what model we pick over or over which view of the computer, you're always going to get the same answer. So to prove this, we may as well first go up to where A, to where E has semi-stable reduction, and then just check that good is the same as J being integral and multiplicative is the same as J being non-integral. So assume E has semi-stable reduction. So in the good case, well, that means that delta is a unit. And A is, of course, in the ring. So that means that J is going to be in all. And in the multiplicative case, well, that's bad reduction. So delta is not going to be in R, in R star. It's actually in the maximum ideal. But we said that in the multiplicative case, A and B are both units. When you do this quotient, you're getting a unit divided by something in the maximum ideal, so J is not. So let me do. Let me give you a very simple example. But this is kind of a, a good one to keep in mind. So suppose that we do y squared equals x cubed plus p, and our field is cubed. So this um, a is our a is zero, and our b is p, and our delta is some minus sixteen times twenty-seven, which is. <coughs> So this says additive reduction. When I reduce my p, this goes away and you get the cusp of a and b are both in the maximum field. The j invariant is minus 1728 times 4 a cubed, so that's 0, divided by delta. 0. So it's in R. That says that we should have potentially good reduction. And it's actually easy to see how to get that. Uh, if you take what I was calling u to be the sixth root of p, right, then this, you can scale out this p and make it a 1. So if you change, if you do the change of variables, x, y goes to uh, p to the 1 third x, p to 1 half y, then you're going to get a p here and a p here, and you can divide through, and this makes you get the equation y squared equals x plus 1. This this works over QP adjoining Q to the one six. So there you get the reduction. Are there any questions about how this works? You always have to go to a random cut extension because we showed right over an unrandom cut extension nothing ever changes. In case they're both in our stuff. Oh. Semi stable means. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Alright. So now I want to talk about what the reduction map does on torsion. I'm going to assume for this this part of the lecture, we're only in the good reduction case. So, like I said, this means that our minimal virus stress model is a smooth group scheme over R, smooth and proper. Projected, smooth and this implies that the end torsion is a finite flat group scheme. Over R. So finite and flat. So why why are those adjectives true?
So the, the map that I want to study at the moment is, is something like, you know, take the inversion in E over K or maybe K bar and look at its map down to the special fiber. And what can you say about this map? Okay, so first let me, okay, so the first thing to say is that if N is prime to the characteristic, the residue characteristic, then this map is an isomorphism. But let me state that a little more generally. It's a proposition. Suppose that G is a finite flight group scheme and the order of G is invertible on R. Then you can map the K bar points of G down to the little K bar points of G, and that's an isomorphism. And it's an isomorphism of Galois modules. So Gal K bar over K modules. And again, this reduction map is just because this thing is the same thing as doing G of R bar. This is fine. That's what you can do. And the proof is basically just because we know that in this situation, G is a tau. So everything is as nice as it can be. So the, this map here, the map is Galois over here. That's just sort of clear. And so it suffices to check it's a bijection. And you can do that by making a finite phase check. You can do that after passing to an extension. Okay. So since G is invertible, that implies that it's a tau. And that implies that after some base change, it's just a constant. Statement is obvious for the kind of put Z mod NZ there, it's obvious that the K, K points and the K points this. <coughs> and so, just to explicitly state it, in the elliptic curve case, if N is prime to the characteristic of little k, and E has good reduction, we're still assuming that. Then the map from the end version of the k bar points to the end version of the little k bar points is an isomorphism of Galois modules. And that implies, in particular, that the end version is unramified as a Galois representation because inertia group X trivial down here. Okay, so there's a more interesting statement that we can make when uh, n is not assumed to be practical as we can So if we're in the setting where we're no theorem holes, then we can say something else. So for simplicity, let me assume that k is an extension of 2p. is less than t minus 1. And g is a finite flat group scheme over r. Then the map from r points, little k points, is injected. So the reduction map on the portion is injected. And here's the proof. So let me call gamma the group of R points, which I'm going to think of as a constant group scheme overall. So of course there's a natural map from 
the end of the G of group states. And I'm going to let gamma bar be the steam theoretic image. And that's the same thing as the scheme theoretic closure of G of K in G. And so this map from gamma to gamma bar. Over k, it's not really doing anything. It's an isomorphism. And so Renault, Renault's theorem implies then that it's an isomorphism over r. So in other words, this map from our gamma here to G is a closed indent. So this thing is a closed subgroup of G. And so that implies that if I do the K points of gamma and going down to the, sorry, the R points of gamma mapping to the K points of gamma, the G of K, this thing here is objective. And this thing here is an isomorphism because gamma is constant. And this thing here is the same thing as G of K. So the key point really is that when those theorem is telling you that these sections over R are not somehow collapsing. And so let me give you an example to show how this can fail if you don't assume. Actually, before I show you how it fails when you don't have the application of the quality, let me first explain that this map doesn't have to be subjective. We were in, when we were looking at the case where you were prime to the order of the residue field, then we said that this map was an isomorphism because we were tied. So in this lower application case, it's injective, but even now, it doesn't have to be searching for it. And here's an example. Take G to be the extension, so the Coomer extension, of Z mod Z by mu P corresponding to some element A in our ring. Maybe I want it in our star, it's not going to matter. So what, it, what is, so let me tell you what, what I mean by this uh, in terms of the functor of points. If A is an R algebra, which let me assume doesn't have any eigenvalence, connected R algebra, then the A points of this group scheme are the set of pairs, I comma Z, where I is an element of Z mod PZ, and Z is a P root so Z is an element of A, and Z to the P is equal to A to the I. So it's an I over P through the A, P through the A again. And that's a group just by you know, doing the group operations on each I and Z, multiplying the Z's and adding the I's. So if our ring R, R has no p fruits of unity, no primitive p fruits of unity. And no p fruits of A. Then G of R is just zero. You only have the trivial point in the side of there. On the other hand, if you assume that the residue field is perfect, then I mean this is an extension of new p by z p. So it's, it's perfect, it splits. We don't have a connected with house that splits it. And in this case, you can see that very easily. If the residue field is perfect, then 
this A is going to have a P2. So over the residue field, so if K is perfect, then uh, G is just the product. G over K is just the product of Z minus P and UP. And so that implies that it has a lot of K products. So you're not subjective. Does this make sense? Okay, so if, second remark, if E is greater than or equal to P minus one, it's not, it's not necessarily in the You have to be less creative to find the kind of example here. Someone have one? This is basically the same as finding a counterexample for a nose theorem, which we already talked about. So if you take, take G to be mu P and K to have P roots in it, then G of R is going to be the P roots of 1 with K. And G is the base field, you know, of the residue field. There are no P roots of 1 in this, this thing. Assume that this is like, you know, QP to a new P. So this is a finite field that doesn't have any features of one. So that map's obviously not injected. Okay, so a corollary of this general proposition, let me just state it for a little curves. So if, um, let's say, K is over QP and E is less than P minus one, and E has good reduction, then uh, the reduction map on N torsion on K points is injected. It's important that it's K there, this doesn't work for K bar. It's sensitive to the ramification index. So now we move on and talk about the kernel of the reduction map. That was this E1K. So I'm going to tell you what the structure of this is. So the, these are the points, remember. So this was the points in E0 that reduced to the trivial point. Identity I'm no longer assuming that the D has good reduction. So in other words, I mean these points are all p adequately or m adequately, respect to the maximum ideal, close to the identity point of D. It's not m, they're they are the point. So to study this thing, it would make sense to change coordinates so that the identity point is at the origin. So our, our equation that we usually work with is y squared is x q plus ax plus d. But really, we should be using the projective equation, which is zy squared is x cubed plus a z squared x plus d z cubed. And normally, we take little x to be big x over z and little y to be big y over z. And use those functions. But now, I'm going to define uh, u to be x over y and D to be Z over Y. So uh, the equation in, in terms of U and B then becomes uh, B is U cubed plus A B squared U plus B D D cubed. And the identity point on E is just given by U B equals zero zero. Because right, in projective coordinates, big X is 0, big Z is 0, big Y is 1. So you, you have to So I'm going to call this right hand side F of UV. So 
we can do this cool thing. So this is saying that v is equal to f of u v. So we can take that equation and plug it into this v. And so you get that v is equal to f of u comma f of u v. And then you can keep doing that. And you eventually just get an expression for v in terms of u. It's an infinite expression. So this says that v is equal to v of u. So v of u is f of u, f of u, f of u, and just keep going. I mean, if you look at how this is working, I mean, you're never introducing any denominators, and you're just getting higher and higher powers of u. So this thing here is actually a power series of coefficients in R. And so this is just a, a formal process. I mean, it doesn't mean anything yet. But you can prove the following. So I'm not going to do this. This is not hard. Uh, the, the map sends p e1 of k and takes an element u here to the pair u comma p of u to the bijection of sets. of u actually means something because our DVR is complete. Right? If we have a power series with integral coefficients, we can plug in something in the maximum ideal and it will converge. In the end. So you just get higher and higher p powers of p to go up. This is not an isomorphism of group. It's not a group homomorphism. But using this bijection, we can take the group law on the target and move it back to M. And so I'm going to call that plus with a circle. And the group law on E is given by some algebraic thing, and this isomorphism is given by some power series. So perhaps it's not too surprising that you can show that this addition is also given by power series. So S plus T is equal to G of S T for some power series G coefficients in R. In fact, I mean, this map takes 0 and M to the identity here. And so 0 is the identity for this plus group law. So that means that G of S0 is equal to G of 0 S, which is equal to S. And so that implies that G of ST, its first two terms are just S plus T, and then there's more stuff. And so one thing in particular that implies is that the nth power of the maximum ideal is a subgroup through this plus operation. So you plug in two things that have valuation n, so is the result. And I'm going to call E sub n what happens when I transfer this subgroup back by that nice mode. So just, I mean, for free, I mean, we have these, I mean, we have this filtration here at MN, and I've just moved it over, so the graded pieces are just the same. So if I do EN of K mod EN plus 1 of K, that's isomorphic to MN mod N, MN plus 1 as groups. But on the right side, I'm supposed to be using the funny plus. But since the funny plus is the normal plus with higher things, when I kill the next power of the ideal, just the normal plus. So this is just the usual mn by n plus, n plus 1, and that's isomorphic to the residue. So 
this proves that uh, E1 of K has a filtration and the associated key graded pieces. So um, another way to say this is if, if k is finite, the characteristic p, uh, this says that e1 of k is a pro p. If the residue field is not finite, then the k points are not going to be compact. So it's not going to be a pro finite group. But when k is finite, points are compact, and it's the same as pro And another corollary of this is that if n is prime to the residue characteristic, then the reduction map in n torsion is injected. Right, because the kernel, oh sorry, this is going to E bar smooth points. And I want to look at the reduction map only on my E1 or E0. Sorry, what's the word you put associative? The has a filtration. Oh. Right, and the reason for this is just that the kernel of this reduction map from E0 to E bar is E1, and we've shown that that's just made up of Ks. So if you have some group that's primed to the character of K, it can't intersect that curve. So it has to be injected. And so this reproves what we proved in the smooth case. When E has good reduction, this holds also more generally. Alright, so we've understood E1. E0 mod E1 is just the k points of the smooth locus downstairs, so we sort of understand that. So now, how does E0 differ from the full set of rational points? And so here's a theorem which addresses that. So I'll state it in three pieces. So first, the quotient is fine. Second, if E has split multiplicative reduction, then this group is cyclic, and its order is equal to the negative of the J invariant, the valuation of the J invariant. And otherwise, if it's not split multiplicative the reduction, then this quotient has size at most four. to prove this, but I want to make some remarks about it. So first of all, the finiteness statement, just that you're finite, follows easily from the existence of narrow models, which I'm going to talk about next time. And then parts B and C follow from the classification of narrow models, where there's special fibers. Known exactly what kind of behavior you can get on a special fiber, that is enough to prove B and C. Uh, if the residue field is compact, it is finite. 
then A is easy. And the reason is, if little k is finite, that means that our big field of capital K is locally compact. It's like a finite extension of QP. And so the k points are a compact group. So in this case, E of k is compact under the strong topology of k. And this subgroup E0 is easily seen to be an open subgroup. So that means that the quotient is both compact and discrete. Of course, that makes it fine. So you might think that's the only case that you care about because you usually are a refined extension of QP. But in a minute, it's going to be very important to remember this holds when you pass the unramified extension, the full unramified extension of the And so this compactness argument doesn't work there. Uh, but there is a proof of this that doesn't use narrow models. So you can prove the full theorem without narrow models. Uh, but it's kind of a case by case thing. Uh, I haven't gone through all the cases. I don't actually know if this is true. Silverman says this is a good thing. It's worth it. Um, but I, I did one of them. So let me show you how that works. So it's kind of nice. It's a very simple argument. So suppose that we're in the case where our A has valuation 1 and our B has valuation at least 2. These are the kind of cases you can check. Different ranges of valuation. So if we have a point on our curve x, y, so remember our equation is y squared is x cubed plus a x plus b, and we're assuming that a and b are both in the maximum here. We have attitude reduction, and the singular point downstairs is 0, 0. So if p is x, y, then you can check that the x coordinate of 2p is given by the following formula. So it's some rational function upstairs is x to the fourth minus 2ax squared minus 8bx plus a squared. And downstairs you have 4 times x cubed plus ax plus b. And so if p reduces to the singular locus, to the singular point, well, that means that x is in the maximum ideal. So it has a valuation at least 1. And now if you look at this expression, this a, has a squared has valuation exactly 2. bx, well, b has valuation at least 2, and x has valuation at least 1. So this has valuation at least 3. And this has an x squared and an a, so it's also at least 3. And this is also at least 3. So the numerator has valuation exactly 2. And if you look downstairs, everything down here has valuation at least 2. So this explicit computation says that the valuation of the x-coordinate of twice p is at most 0. So it's either integral or has a denominator. And if it has a denominator, that means the point's reducing to the identity point downstairs. And if, I mean, we've shown that the valuation is not infinity. This x coordinate is not going to be zero. So that means that it's not reducing to the singular locus. So this shows that if p reduces to the singular locus, then 2p doesn't. It reduces to the smooth locus. And so this implies that this quotient, e of k minus e0 of k, is killed by 2. And in fact, if you do a little more work, you can show that the addition of any two points that reduce to the singular point reduces to a smooth point, which means this group has to be z mod 2 z, or the trivial group. And in fact, it's always z mod 2 z in this situation. So that made no assumption on the residue field. It wasn't a compactness argument. It works in full generality uh, under these conditions. So that's kind of how this case-by-case -case argument goes, I believe. The final thing I want to talk about today is this neuron og schaff ravich criteria. So that's the following. This is the statement of the criteria. 
So suppose L is prime and not equal to the characteristic of the rest of the thing. So I'm going to say the theorem in two parts. So first, uh, E has good reduction. If and only if the Tate module, the L Tate module, is unramified. Meaning that the inertia group, IK, X trivial. And two, E has semi stable reduction, if and only if the inertia action. module is uniform. That means it looks like upper triangle. Here's the proof. So I'll start by doing one, the first thing. So the tape module being unramified is the same thing as all the L inversion being unramified. And so we know that if E has good reduction, then these torsion points are on the outside. So one direction we've already done. So now I want to do the converse. So let's suppose that all of our L to the N torsion is on the line. And that means that it actually, I mean those points, that means that they're actually defined over the maximum on the by extension of okay. K. Assume L to the N portion unramified for all. So let D be the cardinality of this quotient. We're going to do E of K unramified minus E zero. So K on is the maximal unramified extension. And all of our L to the N torsion is defined over that field. And K on, I mean, it is a discreetly valued field. So we're not you know, taking any roots of the uniformizer. So the theorems apply in that situation. It's important for this argument. So if we look at if we look at E0, K unramified intersect with the L portion. But I want to say that this has size at least L to the 2N over B. And that's pretty much obvious because this group here is just the kernel of the map from the L to the N torsion to this quotient here. And this thing here has cardinality up to two, and this thing has cardinality. So the kernel is going to be at least L to the two. I didn't need to write this in the point way. This is obviously just the L to the N portion in E0. So if it's the L to the N portion in E0, it's at least L to the 2N. That's what I just said. But now we also know that this L to the N portion here injects into the L to the N portion downstairs. That was this argument because the kernel was this thing that was filtered by k's. 
case we're talking about. Yeah. So this implies that we have a lot of L to the N torsion down here. But now this, this thing down here, the smooth points for the reduction, that's, there's three cases, right? Elliptic curve, GN, or GA. And the L to the N torsion in GM, that's the L to the N root of unity in K bar that has size exactly L to the N. And the L to the N torsion in GA is zero. And this thing is growing a lot faster than that. So that says that it can't be a torus or GA, so it has to be a little curve. Now let me explain two. Are there any questions about this before I go? Okay, so if the inertia group acts on ramifiedly, or sorry, uniformly, well that means that it has an invariant from the Tate module. Right? I mean this, this basic vector here in the Tate module is invariant. And so that implies that the L to the N torsion contains at least a Z minus And so now the argument is very similar to this case that I just did. I mean, again, you find that the smooth points of the reduction of the L torsion is at least L to the end for D. So it can't be G A. So it's either G M or D. The same argument implies that D e bar is smooth. It's not G A. Okay, so finally we come to the last case where we have semi-stable reduction and we want to show that the inertia acts as a unit book. So I have to use some things that we haven't talked about much, but I think we'll talk about a little more later. So we can consider the smooth points and the minimal Weierstrass model. So, okay. so I'm assuming that E has some nice table reduction. So we can consider the smooth points in this thing. And that's really just deleting the singular point in the special fiber. It's just E minus that one point. And this is a group run over R. Group scheme over R. And its L to the N torsion is a flat group scheme of R. The flatness is, I mean, it's the same reason I said earlier, multiplication by L to the N is going to be a flat map for this thing because it's so smooth. And so the L to the N torsion is flat. But it's not finite. Because in this thing, we've deleted the point, so it's no longer proper. I'm going to define G to be the scheme theoretic closure in this group. Of the set of K bar points which extend to R bar points. So by definition, this is a closed subgroup defined as a closure. And it's also pretty clear that it's um, 
finite because it's you know, by the value of the criterion for properness, I'm sort of forcing this hole in this situation. DDR, I mean, the K points you kind of fill in the points of the whole DDR. So this is a closed finite substance. Closed finite flat subgroup. And in fact, uh, the special fiber of this guy is the full health of the entorsion of the special fiber. That sort of follows from this thing being flat, because there can be no points in the special fiber, which are just kind of isolated there, so you can pick them all up in this way. And so this thing is finite and flat, and L power order, so this G is a top. So that means that its K points map isomorphically, or its K un points map isomorphically to its little k bar points. And this is the little k bar points down here. This tells the end point. <coughs> and because we're assuming semi stable reduction, this E smooth, the E bar smooth, is either an elliptic curve or GN. And so here, this thing contains at least a Z mod L to the end. So that means that this thing does as well. And of course, this thing is just sitting inside the unramified L torsion points B. E. So in other words, we've produced a lot of unramified L to the N torsion for, e, for each S. And that implies that the inertia is going to fix the vector in the L, L eigen module. That means that if you look at the tape module as a representation of inertia, there's going to be, you know, the first column's going to look like that, because it's a fixed vector. And then there's going to be some character here, and some star up there. And so we want to conclude that alpha is one also. And so why is that the case? Yeah, so alpha is the determinant. We know that that's the L adic cyclotomic character. And on, I mean, this restricts to the inertia of the trivial character. L fits the unity or unramified since we're those two characters to keep. Okay, so that shows that this inertia group is acting uniform. So you saw here that these, this kind of group seem the smooth look of the LVM torsion of this model. This is a finite, uh, not a finite group scheme, but a flat group scheme. And it sort of has this finite piece in it, and, but maybe not all of it sits in there. So we're going to talk more about group schemes that look like this later on. So I think this picture will become more clear then. Uh, but you should keep this in mind for motivation for that discussion. I don't know, I might do that next time, maybe, maybe later. Are there any questions? <coughs> 